G'day viewers. I have here a really rare thing. This is some Irish cream that's actually nice. I'm going to show you the bottle. It's absolutely delicious. Um, and I thought it would be the perfect accompaniment to a little video about the shillelagh. Okay, uh, what is it? What are the options that you have when you're thinking about getting or making one? Um, and what does it look like when you use it? And what are the sort of, what is the context in which it was used? So uh, settle in and let's have a look at some shillelaghs. So let's talk a little bit about shillelaghs, uh, the different types, what the options are if you go to acquire yourself a shillelagh, what should you be looking for, what should you be doing to it? So historically, observers tended to divide Irish sticks into two broad categories, a long one and a short one. Now, the short one was invariably called an apline or a variation thereof, a plane meaning knob, so it was a knobbed stick. And if we look at the iconography, one of the most common sorts of shillelaghs that are depicted are these short knobbly club things. Now these are extremely rare to come across any sort of surviving examples of these, probably because it's quite obviously a club and not a walking stick. Um, but nonetheless, I actually have an antique one here, which is very exciting and really the main reason I decided to make this video. So if I come close, you can see it's extremely knobbly, okay? And those knobs up at the sort of root end of it really concentrate the force when you strike. So even though it's extremely light, if you were smacked in the head with that, that would be absolutely excruciatingly unpleasant. So you can see why these were favoured as a fighting stick. Now here's a fun bit of trivia. The thing that this reminds me most of is another weapon that I have, which is this. So this is an Aboriginal club, uh, often called a waddy. Um, and Every, I've had this for years and I pick it up and every time I pick it up I think what an awesome super duper intuitive weapon it would be very easy to kill people with one of these it's great it does everything and despite having had it for years and years and years I've always just held it as I hold a broadsword and a sort of you know normal sort of hammer grip but having just done a shillelagh course I happen to pick it up and hold it as you hold a shillelagh with your thumb along the back there and to my astonishment I discovered that all this time it has had a carved out depression right there for the thumb. So this is the way it was intended to be gripped all along and I never noticed because I never did it. Um, so a future project is to get hold of as many Aboriginal weapons as I possibly can and see how many of them have a little indentation for the thumb grip there. So that's a little nice trivial aside. The shillelagh proper was usually described as being as a four foot stick. Now, four feet is quite long, okay? It's too long to really work well as a walking stick. It's actually hard to sort of support your weight on it. However, the reason why they are four feet long is to give you an extra foot of wood because the way it's held is with a foot of wood down there to protect your forearm. So you can use your forearm as a parrying surface. Um, now this is something the Irish have a long tradition of uh, using dirks or using gauntlets in places of, place of shields um, in order to parry with the forearm. So this is a, a quite a natural thing for uh, an Irish warrior to come up with. Uh, they're basically straight, they may have a small knob on the end, but nothing like the club like a plane. And uh, the wood that you made it from, there's various options oak ash hazel and of course blackthorn are all mentioned and the historical sources argue back and forth about what the best sort of wood to use is it's probably an entirely local consideration now if you want your shillelagh to 
get a little bit more striking power up at the knobbed end, uh, one of the things you can do is you can load it. That means you drill a hole in it and you pour in molten lead in order to give it a bit more thumb. So here's another cool antique. This stick here has actually been drilled out in preparation for loading. Uh, the, they haven't poured the lead in, uh, but it's all ready to go. So this was in going to be intended to be a loaded fighting stick, which is super cool. Now, I was curious to see how much of a difference a little bit of lead poured in the end actually made. So I made one. So one of our fighting shillelaghs was a little bit rotten at the top, so I drilled out the, uh, the, the wood in order to make a hole. And then I bought this thing off eBay in order to melt the lead. I did have an aborted attempt on the stove top. It doesn't work. You need one of these if you are intending to do this at home. And then I loaded the shillelagh like so. So things I have learned from doing this. First of all, um, a remarkable amount of lead can go into a relatively small hole. There was not an awful lot of empty space inside there, but I ended up putting a fairly reasonable amount of lead in. Um, also, there's an obvious art for making it neat, which I have not yet mastered, but for experimental purposes, it will do. And having made it, I can report that even though the weapon is still, still compared to a broadsword or something, it's still incredibly light, having that extra lump of lead right up on the end really increases the skull crushing power of this thing. Again, it would be deeply, deeply unpleasant to be smacked in the head with one of these. Uh, so a really fun experiment. Uh, and if you're actually gonna be hitting people on the head for real, it's probably a good idea. Uh, for friendly bouting purposes, I would recommend against loading your shillelagh. So I've decided to find out exactly how much difference loading the shillelagh actually makes to the damage you can do. So a little experiment here. Uh, so I have two shillelaghs uh, made out of the same type of wood, privet, if you're in any way interested, uh, with the, about the same sized knobs, one in its natural unloaded state and one loaded with lead. Um, and as a target, I have got a honeydew melon as a substitute for a tough Irish skull. And I have made a little bit of homemade netting, which I'm quite proud of, and strung it up on a tree. So this is the target, honeydew melon, hanging on a tree in some homemade netting. So let's see how it goes when it's hit with a stick. First of all, the unloaded shillelagh. I will show you what damage that did. So that blow neatly cracked the melon, okay? Little bit of flesh um, displaced on top, but that's the damage that I can do with an unloaded shillelagh, which is actually more than I was expecting considering it's a very light piece of wood. Now let's try that again with the lead loaded shillelagh. Right, well, that basically just destroyed the melon. So you can see that did an enormous amount of damage compared to the first one that just destroyed it. Um, so yes, so loading a shillelagh makes an enormous difference to the amount of power between one little crack on that side and complete destruction on the other side. You can really feel the difference when you're swinging this thing. It's basically a mace. It's going to completely crush skulls. Um, does a, a lot more damage than I was really expecting it to. Um, which is interesting because historically we know that uh, faction fights were very much a initially a kind of social sp rough sport, shall we say, but they did get more and more deadly and more and more dangerous as time progressed, um, which suggests that initially using just sticks, it could really be just a rough game. 
However, as things got more serious and people tried to make their weapons more deadly, and we have accounts of people bringing scythes and even guns to these things, um, that may be when the habit of loading the shillelagh came in, because this, this is now a deadly weapon. Now, blackthorn was favoured as a fighting stick wood precisely because it has thorns on. Okay, so I met uh, an elderly Irish gentleman back in Ireland 25 probably years ago now. Um, and one of the things he told me is the great thing about blackthorn is you've always got the thorns. In other words, you leave the thorns on the stick, such as this. Because in the end, it's just a stick. You swing a stick at somebody, they can catch it with their hand. And that's a historical, the attested shillelagh technique. If you've got a blackthorn, that prevents that because I can tell you being hit by that would absolutely lacerate your hand. That would, show you that, that would be out as a technique. So thorns are a good option. Um, other things that we are told you could do with your shillelagh are instead of just having an iron ferrule on the end, actually put a full spike on, okay? Two or three inch spike out of the end there. That means that you can use your shillelagh, uh, as one account says, like a rapier. So I can go from this grip to that grip, and if I'm good at fencing, I can use the spike at the end in order to stab people from a long way away, as well, of course, using it as a bit of a dagger for that end there. So again, if you're doing it for real, three inch spike on the end, jolly good idea. Uh, another option you've got is to put a sword knot in. That is a sort of a, a leather loop there that goes around your wrist. And this was not uncommon, and you give it a few twists. And now, if this is knocked out of my hand during combat, which happens more than you might think, I don't lose my stick. I can get, get it back nice and quickly. The other thing the sword knot does, which I didn't know until I made it, is that it gives me a second point of leverage. I can now use the tension between my wrist and the stick through that cord there to actually manipulate the stick. I can arrest it and change direction with it a lot faster than I can um, if I was just using one-handed grip. So the sword knot actually makes the stick a lot more maneuverable, which is another good reason to have one. Disadvantage, however, is it restricts me to this grip, okay? So once that sword knot is on, I can't really let go with this hand. So I can no longer do my tricky rapier thing, okay? I'm stuck with this grip. So that is a disadvantage. So very much swings and roundabouts on the uh, sword knot. A final option to consider is another weapon that is mentioned as being used in faction fights, which is a hurley. That is the stick though with which one played hurley. Um, now, if you've seen a modern hurley, stick they're quite sort of broad um, I've got one upstairs and being hit with the edge of that would be like being struck by an axe okay um, however his historically these are much more likely to have been much thinner hooked sticks much more like a, an old shinty stick um, in other words something like this now the advantage of using a shinty stick or hurley stick as opposed to a straight shillelagh is obviously that you've now got a hook that you can use to hook around your opponent's guard and if you are a experienced hurley player then you will be quite comfortable in using this and again it also reminds us that you don't need to use the shillelagh just like that you can also use it in two hands and that could be like that or like that or like a bayonet Okay, so it's an extremely flexible weapon in the way you use it. And the type of shillelagh that you get will really depend on which of, the, which of these techniques you actually like using. So if you're going to make your own shillelagh, uh, start now because you need to season it for a, a good year or two, depending on the weather and where you live, in order to let it dry out. Um, keep the bark on don't shave the bark off. That is a mistake that we have made in the past. Turns out that you want to leave the bark on the stick. Um, if it splits, and sometimes they do, and one of the arguments against Blackthorn was that it split more easily than other woods, uh, these were often fixed by having iron bands around to hold the stick together. Um, I'm sure you can come up with some 
equivalent of that, if not just use iron bands to hold it together. Um, you'll notice that this is black. In fact, if I get my blackthorn, if you buy a shillelagh from a shillelagh maker, that will almost certainly be covered in black, sort of marine lacquer, I think that is. Um, historically, of course, this is not how it was done. Historically, they were blackened by painting them in butter and sticking them up the chimney to smoke. Now, I read this and I thought, that's interesting, I will give that a go. So the first shillelagh I ever made was this one, and I did indeed, I did the butter thing. I would paint it in butter and stick it up the chimney and let it sit in the smoke. Um, and it did in turn, as you can see, turn black. The other thing that it did, however, is it was sticky to the touch and the stickiness, like every time you picked it up, it was just like, ew. And that lasted for four or five years, okay? It's finally worn off now. But for those first or four or five years, you pick it up and you just go, ew, that feels distinctly unpleasant. Um, but if you want to go to that level of authenticity, I applaud that. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's a really good, useful, proper, authentic shillelagh now. If you want just a, a simple fighting shillelagh, um, a really good thing to use is a four foot rattan stick. Uh, I got this, I've got a pair of these online from a local martial arts shop because they're used for some martial arts somewhere. But a four foot rattan stick is actually a really, really good substitute for a shillelagh. It feels very, very much like the uh, authentic ones that I've got there. And of course, it's nice and tough and long lasting. So uh, one of these is a good choice, particularly if you want to equip like a whole school or a whole class of people with shillelaghs. Four foot rattan sticks will do the job just fine. So, so this video has been going on for a while. Um, so I'm actually going to split it in two. So we'll be back in a couple of days with part two of Shillelagh, uh, where we will see some Shillelagh in action. See you then.